I'm Benjamin Bakshian. I'm the head of Generations SOS here at Beverly Hills High. First of all, I wanted to say thank you guys so much for coming. It means a lot that you guys have all made the time to be with uh, Mr. Jack Buckley to come share his story. Um, so, for the last few months, I've been part of the uh, Youth Advisory Board of the Generations SOS. First of all, it's Generations SOS, the club at Beverly, that's separate from Generations and also separate from SOS, Signs of Suicide. Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer organization where we talk, we empower youth to empower other youth to make healthier choices through the power of storytelling. It's so important to understand the risk factors that contribute to negative mental health or someone using or abusing substances, ranging from daily stressors to anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, social or academic pressures, and so on. Uh, what's unique about Generations SOS is that it's prevention-based, providing a safe community to talk about mental health and substance battles without a stigma or shame, offering coping skills to help tolerate, tolerate and minimize the effect of situations you face. So to give an overview really quickly of the disease of effect addiction, uh, I'd like to share some important uh, statistics and facts. Half, 50% of adolescents will have a serious mental health issue at some point, and so often can lead to substance misuse and sometimes addiction. Addiction and overdose is the leading cause of death for people under 30. Some someone, usually a young adult, dies from drugs roughly every three minutes in our country. That's nearly 500 deaths per day. 90% of the time, substance misuse and addiction start during adolescence. And lastly, due to shocking rises in fentanyl, fentanyl laced drugs, experimenting with a drug for the first time is sometimes all it takes. So, uh, while Generation SOS started in a living room seven years ago, following six tragic uh, overdoses in the NYC school community, this video that we're gonna show right now really helps describe the evolution and incredible growth that Generation SOS has made and continues to make in cities all around the, uh, America. I remember my first way of coping was I would daydream. I would find a little dark nook in a closet or build a little fort underneath blankets and just pretend I was somewhere else and pretend I was someone else. Anyone but myself and I was living a life that was not my own. And I knew at that time when I was a senior in high school that alcohol meant freedom and it meant happiness. Middle school sucked. In seventh grade, I tried to like kill myself because of like all the amount of bullying I was like experiencing. I just was like, at 12 years old, I was like, I'm done. You know, I've seen enough. And more and more when I share about that, it makes me so sad to think that like at that age, like I was like ready to throw in the towel. And I think that the mental aspect of addiction is so powerful that sometimes it manifests like much much earlier than when you start using. I would say the only thing that maybe I wish I had when I was younger is, you know, a more honest relationship with my parents and that my parents had a healthier relationship with alcohol and drugs. There is such thing as normal drinking and it's not this evil, evil, bad thing. But in my mind, it kind of got muddled up. So when I started to experiment with drugs and alcohol, I thought I was experimenting with this evil, evil, dark thing, so I didn't want to talk about it. Seven years ago, I lost my oldest son, Austin, to an overdose, and he had struggled with addiction for over six years, and it was an anguishing journey, and it was very, very tough, obviously, on him. We, we lost a beautiful boy. It was very tough on our family, and I decided I wanted to dedicate the rest of my life to this work to try to spare other young adults and spare their families from going through what we went through. I heard Jim's story and I knew that um, we had to do this journey together. And we both came from different sides of the journey. Jim tragically lost his son and I went through my own addiction and watched all of these other kids die around us. And in both cases, it was sort of the same feelings of people living in isolation. And so by all of us getting together and sharing our stories, nobody is alone and everybody realizes that they have not only the similar feelings, but they have something to offer to help other people. So we first opened up the dialogue surrounding addiction 
five years ago um, following six tragic overdoses in our New York City school community. And ever since, we've met monthly to hear young sober speakers share their story, followed by a discussion about the realities of drugs and alcohol for adolescents. So we're really excited. We now have chapters in Miami and LA in addition to New York. We also have a lot of school clubs and we're planning, hoping to um, expand even more to further cities and communities. At Generation SOS, we really do believe that stories speak louder than statistics. If I had something like Generation SOS or knew about that, um, it would have been helpful for me to like not feel so, uh, I don't want to say stigmatized, but like feel weird about uh, what was going on in my life. I think growing up, I think especially through high school and stuff, at least when I was there, it's like, for some reason, it's, it's being yourself is always frowned upon, you know what I mean? And you always put on these personas and now I like, through this process, I've learned to be myself and love myself for who I am that, you know, now, now I don't crave these substances to help me escape from me. It's important to share my experience. It creates a humanity and a bond between people. If you like listen to and empathize with someone who's like maybe has similar issues in some departments, but is different in like outside departments. I'll end it by saying that you're enough, you're adequate, you're, you deserve to be loved, you deserve your place in the world. Black, white, green, woman, tall, short, whatever, trans, whatever, you deserve to be loved and you deserve your place in the world. I wish I could tell you that when you lose a child, it gets easier over time. Um, it doesn't. You, um, you, you learn to love that child in a different way. This is a picture of Austin that I keep on my desk all the time. I think of him every day. I talk to him every day. I listen to the couple recordings of his voice that I have, but uh, it doesn't get better and you don't forget. And that's, that's why I'm so motivated to, to help other parents avoid that. It is, it is said that's the greatest pain you can experience on earth is to lose a child. And I suspect that's true. Addiction kills, prevention saves lives. Please go to generationsos.org and make a monthly contribution to help us continue saving young lives. Thank you. So, uh, how this is going to work is for the next 15 to 20 minutes, our speaker Jack is going to share his story. Um, and then right afterwards, either if you guys feel comfortable, you can raise your hands. Also, we have flashcards, so I'm going to pass these around. And uh, anonymously, if you guys want to ask questions and bring it up. Uh, and then we can do a Q&A for the last 10 minutes. So, uh, without further ado, I'll let you go. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Let's see how I'm comfortable on this microphone. Uh, I've got a timer going here. I want to leave as much time for questions, if there are any, after this. <clears throat> what a powerful video that was. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here and to speak on issues that are as deep and as serious and as relevant as the things that Generation SOS is talking about. My name is Jack. I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. And at one point in my life or another, I was the same age as every single one of you in this room. And now I'm 32. And I'm gonna tell you a secret that I don't know if you've heard. Maybe times are a lot more progressive now than they were when I was your age, but when it comes to your inner world of thoughts and feelings, right? You being a human being, the things that you think about, the things that you feel, it's the same at your age, as it is at my age, as it is at your parents' age, your teacher's age, your coach's age, it's all the same stuff. The difference between immaturity and maturity is not age. It's just an awareness of what's going on inside of you. It's the ability to articulate how you feel, what you're thinking, and to share it with people if you choose to share it with, to feel better. I look at this video and I see these kids who we lost, you know, and we didn't lose them because the root cause, the reason we lost them, is not because they had a drug and alcohol problem. Alcohol is a drug, by the way, so let's just say drug. We didn't lose them because they had a drug problem. We lost them because they were human beings, and they were sensitive human beings who felt the same things that I feel, anxiety, fear, insecurity. And they found a solution to that problem in drugs, and those drugs killed them. 
So what I'm here to do today is tell my story and hopefully give you an alternative. Not alternatives isn't even a strong enough definition. I want to give you a far, far superior solution to the human condition that we all have than drugs and alcohol. So, uh, my parents were 27 when they had me, which is young. That's young. I'm 32. I'm, I, I don't have kids. 27, you know, 32 years ago. It's a young age to have children. And I was moving around a lot because of my dad's job. My mom was very nervous for me. She loved me. I was her firstborn. She wanted to keep me safe. So her method of keeping me safe was the same method that her parents used to keep her safe, which was to instill fear. Don't do this because of that. Don't climb the tree because you're going to fall off and break your neck. Don't go in the public restroom by yourself because you're going to get kidnapped and taken away, etc. That was the way that I was taught things. So I went from being a free, happy, independent kid to being taught through fear. And what that did, and by the way, God bless my mom. I come from a very loving, amazing household. Um, but that sort of method of learning left me in a state of panic, left me in a state of anxiety, left me in a state of fear from my earliest. My earliest memories as a kid, that's how I felt. I felt nervous, I felt scared. And the most interesting thing about that is I can now say in retrospect that I was anxious and I was afraid and I was nervous since my earliest memories up until this very moment today. But I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know what the word anxiety meant. I didn't know what it was until I was 25. So I'm in school, you know, I'm in elementary school, and I'm terrified. I'm terrified of kids like you, what you think of me. Do you think I'm cool? Do you think what I'm wearing is right? Do you think my hair looks right? Do you think I'm smart? Do you think I'm funny? Am I charming? Am I liked by you? Am I accepted by you? Top top of mind all the time, and it still is to this day, because I'm still the same human being I was then. Then there was Thanksgiving when I was 14, where my cousins and I decided we were going to get into the family wine. Uh, I come from a big Irish family on my dad's side, so everyone was, was deep into the evening, deep into the drinking, and we were able to sneak wine without anybody noticing. And I, I have always been taught, like I said, through fear, stay away from drugs and alcohol. They're dangerous, they'll kill you, bad, 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 scary, scary, scary. And you know what I learned the second that I tried them? This isn't scary at all. This isn't bad at all. For the first time in my life, I can take a deep breath. For the first time in my life, I don't have anxiety. I don't have social anxiety. I'm not afraid. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what anyone thinks of me. I feel happy. I feel content. I feel joy. That was my first experience putting a drug into my body. And I knew that was the answer. Okay, this is what I'm going to do from now on. For the first time in my life, at 14, I feel well. I'm going to chase this. So, as drugs tend to do, especially a drug like alcohol, which is so common, so prevalent, it took a while for it to really start to screw up my life. I was also an athlete in college, I'm mean, sorry, in high school. I was a, a rower. I come from Philadelphia. Um, I don't know if you have that out here. I rode boats. It was a very competitive sport, so I didn't have the chance to drink very often. But then I went to college, and the stars aligned for my alcohol problem because I did have an opportunity to drink more often, and it was seen as very cool to drink often. I did Greek life. I did the fraternity thing. I don't know how familiar you are all with that culture yet as you're still in high school. Maybe you have older siblings or friends that have been a part of that, but uh, I fit in. I fit in really, really, really well. And I decided, you know what? I've always been this sensitive, scared, insecure kid, but here's my chance to start over. I can drink all the time. I can use drugs all the time. I'm going to become something else. I'm not going to be the scared kid that I truly am. I'm going to be the cool guy. I'm going to be the guy that doesn't give an F about anything. You know, whatever. The toxic masculine, as we call it these days. There wasn't that name for it at the time. But that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be someone who didn't feel, didn't feel emotions, didn't have emotions. It was way too tough to have emotions. Never cried, never felt, never had insecure thoughts. That's who I wanted to be. So that's what I pretended to be throughout college. I put on that mask. I used drugs and alcohol to keep me there to numb everything that I felt inside. And it worked for a little while. 
because drugs and alcohol will work for a little while. But here's the problem, they're gonna stop working. And then that root cause, that human condition that every single person in this room has, it's just louder for some people. For some people, it's, it's a little more difficult, but that root condition is no longer gonna be treated by the alcohol and the drugs. And that's what we call friends of mine that are also sober. We call that, we call that a pit of despair, where your solution that you found no longer works. That's the real bottom. And I hit that bottom. I remember literally falling to my knees at one point in a friend's backyard because I had drank so much for so long that I couldn't even feel drunk anymore. There was a time in the beginning, like I said, when I was 14, when a couple glasses of wine, I felt incredible. Now I've been drinking vodka around the clock for two weeks, literally nonstop, and I couldn't even feel drunk anymore. And I felt as insecure and as fearful as I had ever felt in my whole life. <clears throat> So I didn't know what to do, you know? And I wanted it all to end. I was like, I, I don't know what to do because I can't keep drinking and I can't stop drinking. I can't keep doing drugs and I can't stop doing drugs. I don't know how to have a conversation without Adderall. I don't know how, I would watch TV shows, I would watch The Office, mm -hmm. and I would be like, how are all those characters up and about and talking and at work without Adderall? I was heavily, heavily addicted to uh, the amphetamine Adderall. Um, I didn't understand what life could possibly look like without drugs. And then I asked for help. Somehow I mustered the courage and I had the willingness to ask someone I knew for help. Someone I knew had a father who was sober many years and I called that friend, he put me in touch with his father and then my road to rebuilding my entire way of life began. And it did rebuild. It did. And it's just, it's, it's so striking and amazing that, that I thought once that I couldn't live life without drugs and alcohol. I don't even miss drugs and alcohol. I don't need it. And here's why. I learned tools. I learned tools to deal with that human condition, that root, that root cause of what all the drug addiction comes from. I'm just a sensitive guy. As I stand here right now, I'm wondering what you think of me. It's the same, I promise you it's the same thing. Always, it's the human condition. But here's the difference. I have a space between myself and my thoughts and my feelings. When I was younger, it was like there was a pool inside of me, right? In my mind, in my brain, and I was just stuck with all these feelings of I'm less than, I'm not as good. Now it's like a river. I have a thought come, an insecurity, it comes, it passes, it goes. It comes, it passes, it goes. And I know that I'm not those things. I have that space. And through getting sober, I learned how to achieve that. And I achieved it by doing things like meditating. If you don't meditate, I invite you to look into meditation. It's incredible. Okay? The next time that you're really, really upset by that thing that your friend said that really hurt your feelings that you don't want to talk about because it's too awkward, you can meditate, you can sit, you can look at it, you can be quiet with yourself, you can breathe deeply. And that thing that was so pressing, that was so bothersome, will become just an object. You know, it will just become another thing like a tree in front of you. <clears throat> it's taken me a long time to learn how to exercise these thoughts and feelings and share them. I always thought, like that toxic masculine stuff that I talked about, I always thought that, just checking the time, I always thought that it was really, really, really cool to bottle it up, to not show any emotion, and to fight, and to be a tough guy, and to be a badass, and all these things. It's not. It's really, really, really not, I promise you. It might seem like it at first, it isn't. What's cool, and this might sound corny and cheesy and absurd, but what's really, really cool is to say, hey, you know what, what you just said hurt my feelings, and here's why. When you said this, I heard this, I felt this, and now I'm feeling this. Is that what you meant? That's what my life is full of today. It's asking for clarity. You know, when I talk to another human being and they say something that rubs me the wrong way or makes me feel fearful or insecure, I say, hey, I'm so sorry, what, what you just said, it's causing these feelings for me. It's causing these thoughts for me. What did you mean by that? I go through life with an awareness 
of what's happening inside of me constantly. Like for instance, right now I'm aware that I didn't eat yet today, so my stomach is feeling a little butterfly-y, and I'm a little nervous. I'm talking about my story in front of all of you, and that's fine. The reason these kids died is because they had thoughts and feelings that overwhelmed them. And the only way that they could pacify those thoughts and feelings was with drugs and alcohol. The stakes are too high today. The stakes are way too high. You just die. You accidentally get the wrong thing, a little fentanyl, it's over. The whole thing's over. And you don't get the chance to learn what I learned. I'm lucky that my story got dark fast. I'm lucky that I got arrested. I'm lucky that I hated authority and always yelled at cops when I was drinking and got thrown in jail too many times, and I'm lucky that I had to hit my knees and surrender to this disease. <laughs> Those kids are not. Those kids were not. Lucky. In my day, we didn't have this fentanyl crisis. People didn't just die like this. That's the situation today. And it's not going to be because they're bad kids. It's not going to be because they have some weird, sketchy problem. It's going to be because they were human beings. They were sensitive and they were sad. And that thing that, 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 that their friends said about them in school that they didn't know how to share about just started to weigh on them and weigh on them and weigh on them. And they felt alone. <clears throat> so they tried drugs and they felt better. That's it. My message to you today is drugs and alcohol will not come at you in a scary way. They will come as a friend. They will come as a solution to all of your problems. They'll come as a solution to all of your fears, all of your anxieties. You'll have the confidence to talk to that person you have a crush on. You'll have the confidence to tell your friend how you really feel, because you're drunk, because you're high. <clears throat> it's a fickle friend, and it will stop working. And then you'll be left off worse than you were before. You're so lucky that your generation is so much further than mine was, and than your teachers were. I mean, I met these two people in the back, mental health therapists at school. Like, I, that blows my mind. I had no idea what anxiety was until I was 25. I'm guessing all of you know what the word anxiety means. It's a different day. Talk. Please talk to these people. Let me just check my time one more. Okay. Um, I had someone come in and talk to me when I was your age, exactly like I'm talking to you. And I remember thinking, Okay, he's saying drugs and alcohol are scary. I can't relate. That's not my problem. Don't let things build up. Share your thoughts and your feelings. Share your inner world. Learn three things. Please. Please. Because it will save your life. Learn how to identify what you're feeling and what you're thinking. Learn how to identify why you're thinking and feeling that way. And learn how to articulate that to someone else. That's it. That's it. Then you can be as wise as any adult you've ever met in your life, or wiser. Um, all right, I want to leave some time for Q&A, but thank you all for letting me speak.